Please welcome our next panel, Closing the Racial Wealth Gap. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm so excited to be joined by this wonderful group of panelists for this conversation and talk about the importance of CDFIs and MDIs in closing the racial wealth gap. You know, as Robert mentioned on the panel earlier, the gap today between black families and white families is 7x. And our community banks, our black owned banks, play such an important role in getting capital to communities of color. Um, nationwide, the CDFI industry manages more than $222 billion, creating jobs, affordable housing, financial health, and opportunity for all. And for every dollar invested by these MDIs, that's 10 more dollars that they're able to do. And so such a critical channel to, again, get capital to communities. And really excited to be joined by Nicole from the National Bankers Association, Darren from Southern Bank Corp., Gigi from Wells Fargo, and Mike from Morgan Stanley for this conversation. I want to start with Nicole and Darren. Can you just talk a little bit about the role that CDFIs and MDIs play in communities and the real impact they have on the ground? Yeah, so minority depository institutions are really at the center of wealth creation in communities of color. When you think about how you create wealth, it's really driven by three things. The first is access to financial services. It's really hard to build wealth if you don't have access to financial services. The second is home ownership, continues to be a huge driver of wealth creation. And the third is owning a profitable small business. And MDIs are at the center of all three of those things in communities of color. These are banks that historically black, brown, and immigrant communities could not go to mainstream financial institutions for their banking services. So these banks now sit in communities that are predominantly minority. Take, for example, a black bank. It is sitting in a community that is 60% black population in comparison to maybe another bank that only has 6% black population. So these are banks that are sitting in and serving minority communities, um, underserved, LMI, unbanked, underbanked, underserved, and underbanked communities. And as a result of that, it's not a surprise that they are significant providers of mortgages and small business loans in these communities. So these are banks that have a proven track record of sitting in and serving these communities and being huge lenders in those communities. Um, PPP is a great example, right? When you think about PPP and minority small businesses, those that had established banking relationships fared better with PPP. And those that had banking relationships with mainstream financial institutions eventually ended up at CDFIs and MDIs, where Darren and I are, because that's where they were able to get their PPP loans. So these are wealth builders, wealth creators in these communities. Yes, yeah, so I, I would just echo all what Nicole just said, just a little bit about Southern. So we operate in the Arkansas Mississippi Delta, one of the most persistently poor communities of all the United States, uh, significant population of, of, of African Americans. Uh, in, in six of the markets we serve, we're the only bank in town. In 16, there's one of only two. So we are proximate, which is important, because the closer you are to a bank, the greater access to capital. Uh, and all of our work really focuses on those things that have been proven to build wealth. So Pew has a study that says 70% of the people born into poverty never make it out. It becomes multi-generational. So if your grandma was poor, your mom poor, there's a seven percent chance that you will also in that, in, in that same way. So our work focuses on things that have been proven to build wealth, home ownership, supporting entrepreneurs in, in creating and retaining jobs, and empowering people to save and accumulate assets. And so that's the, that's the focus of everything we do. It comes back to one of those pillars which have been proven to build wealth. Uh, and so CDFIs were proximate. We focus on things that will be proven to build wealth, and we do it in ways uh, that provide for the flexibility that small businesses uh, and, and people of color need. Uh, there's a 30-point there's a home ownership gap between black and white people. Uh, you know, African Americans are twice as likely to be denied for a small business loan. Uh, you look at the rates of, of, of lending from MDIs and CDFIs, we greatly exceed uh, those of mainstream banks, one, because we're proximate, uh, and, because, and because of the scale, um, we're able to really dig deep and, uh, and reach deep into the communities and do the work that we do. That's right, that's right. One of the things we were talking a little bit about earlier is when you think about small businesses, it's certainly the lending capital and the loan capital, but also there's a huge diversity when you look at CDFIs and MDIs in terms of the types of capital they're offering. There is VC, there is private equity. They are really about growing wealth over time for individuals, for small business owners, mid-sized business owners for communities over time, so clearly such a critical role. Um, the Business Roundtable committed $1 billion to CDFIs and MDIs 
uh, by 2025, and so has made a huge commitment to ensuring the capital continues to flow in that direction. Uh, but there are also a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. I think there was a 15% increase from 20 to 21 in, in lending capital flowing to CDFIs and MDIs. Um, but there are challenges and, and opportunities to improve those channels. Nicole, can you talk a little bit about some of those challenges, and maybe specifically for the MDI community? Yeah, so you mentioned that there's been a 15% growth uh, in asset size, and, and that is huge, but it's not huge when you think about the fact that there's been a century plus of undercapitalization. So, you know, one of the biggest ways to prove that point is just to look at the number of MDIs that exist. So MDIs are minority depository institutions that are one, predominantly owned or operated by people of color, and two, sit in and serve predominantly minority communities. At its peak, there were 134 black banks. Today, how many you think there are? 20. Somebody's been doing their homework. 19, 19, right? So how do you go from 134 black banks to now being 19? And a huge reason for that is historic undercapitalization. These aren't banks that have had access to the same capital as mainstream financial institutions. So they've been historically undercapitalized and historically under-resourced. And while that trend is starting to turn, it doesn't in any way, shape, or form make up for the historic undercapitalization that you've seen. It doesn't level the playing field, but it does certainly position them to, to better serve the communities uh, than they had been before. And so some of their challenges goes back to the undercapitalization, the under-resourced, and you know some of the things that they're needing now as everybody is paying attention to lending, 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 you need to pay attention to their infrastructure, right? So these banks are growing in asset size, but they need the infrastructure to push out that lending capital. Because if you're not careful, the headline is gonna be, we gave MDIs and CDFIs all this money and they couldn't push it out. Well, not because they don't want to, they've historically been doing it, but because they don't have the infrastructure that they need. So that's why partnerships are so important that we'll talk about later. Absolutely. Do you anything to add there? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, Nicole and I are speaking from the same hymnal. Um, she's, she's exactly right. I think it's important for me right now to, to thank the BRT members that have invested in Southern Bankers. So Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, have made significant investments, not just um, in equity capital, which is clearly uh, needed, but also in a true partnership where they are providing knowledge capital, uh, mm -hmm. which is very important because to Nicole's point, we've got to grow an infrastructure. We, we were founded in the mid-1980s with you know, 10 million in assets. Today, we're one of the largest CFIs at 2.4 billion, 54 locations throughout the uh, Mississippi Delta. But to go from 2.4 billion to our next iteration, we're gonna to need to build infrastructure. We're gonna to have to increase technology. These are things that the much larger mainstream banks you know, have in abundance. Uh, and so uh, Bank of America, NJ Morgan Chase, and others, even some regional banks, uh, really are now working with us, having conferences, having discussions to talk about how we upgrade our systems, uh, how we, how we uh, do our work better. And so that's been really, really impactful. And so we need those types of partnerships. Uh, and they don't have to be just banks. Uh, it, it, you know, all business and the business roundtable have things that can, that can benefit uh, us as we try to benefit the communities that we serve. Absolutely, absolutely. And this idea of CDFIs and MDIs as channels that, again, get capital to communities. We've invested in all channels. If you think about how much your experience with your bank has changed right. in the last 10 mm -hmm. or 15 years, right? You're using your app. You don't even go to the ATM. You don't need your card to go to the ATM. Think about how all of those interactions have changed so much. And that disruption is what consumers expect, right. what clients expect. And so investing in these channels and the infrastructure is so important, and also in the talent and the partnerships to the point mm -hmm. that you just raised. Dude, can you talk a little bit about how these partnerships have helped you have impact specifically um, in the Delta? Yes, yeah, so surely. So uh, since our initial investments by Bank of America, we've actually acquired two um, community banks. Uh, in, you know, in, 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 in largely African-American communities. Uh, we acquired two $200 million banks, so $400 million in assets. We've grown, but for that equity capital, we couldn't, we couldn't do that. Uh, and so that, that growth has been a direct response to, a, a direct uh, uh, response to what we've been able to uh, receive in equity capital. But we've also been able to create programs that target and geared, geared toward minority business. So we've created a minority business empowerment fund. This is a program that combines small business technical assistance. You know, many small and minority businesses don't invest in the professionals, the accountants, the lawyers, the marketing professionals, because they're, you know, they're small operations. Um, we, we've been able to take some grant capital from, from, from businesses that support us and then provide very flexible lending terms, maybe a loan based on uh, revenue or maybe a loan with interest-only payments for a period of time through our loan fund. Southern is really three CFIs with a, a regulated holding company, a bank, and a nonprofit loan fund. 
And in that unregulated or less regulated entity, we're able to be very, very flexible. And so it's this capital uh, that we receive from uh, the business roundtable uh, members and others that allows us to really go deep and provide the type of capital that those communities need. So we've been able to leverage that support with uh, you know, putting, putting dollars on the ground. So last year we did 8,157 loans. 47.7% uh, of those loans were for less than $10,000. Mm -hmm. 1,644 loans for less than $1,000. You just don't get that size loaned in a, in, a, in a mainstream bank, but that's what the communities we serve, that's what they need, and so we're able to be responsive and do it in a responsible way. Yeah, and I think a point that Darren hit on is so often people talk about capital, 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 but it's coaching that people need, and that's mm -hmm. what we know about our communities. They need that coaching so that they're capital ready, and that requires a lot of hand-holding, and unfortunately, that increases your operational cost when you have to have more people out there helping th them through the process from start to finish, but that's what separates. It's not just about capital, it's about capital and coaching and helping people be capital ready, mortgage ready. Yeah. Those things take time. Yeah, the service model is really quite different. Mm -hmm. It is a more of a high touch, focused. very customer focused, mm -hmm. guiding people along that journey. There's also something I heard you say in that, Darren, around what you've been able to do with some of the equity investment that you've received around acquiring some other banks. And you think about the importance of scale in banking Absolutely. and having higher volume so you could be more efficient and get more of those loans out in a way that's more efficient to allow more of that capital and more of that. Um, investment to go into the coaching and the the high touch model that you have with a lot of the communities. That's really exciting to hear. And then I also want to make sure I emphasize also this point around the loan size. I think that is a really critical point. If you think about how small businesses grow over time, you may not need a twenty thousand or a fifty thousand dollar loan. You might need ten thousand dollars. And so, how do you ensure that you're able to get that that dollar amount out? Um, so, so you know, congratulations first on all the success at Southern and with NBA as well. Uh, it's been really fantastic to continue to watch the success there and, and see the impact that you're having. I want to start to loop Gigi and Mike into this conversation a bit, who have been really you know, important partners to the CDFI and MDI community. Um, Gigi, maybe I'll start with you. Could you just talk a little bit about your partnership uh, with some of the banks that you all work with and um, how, or what are the various ways in which Wells partners, uh, and how has that served your employee base as well? So it's been, um, I've been with the bank for 28 years and I happened to be around when we had over 100 MDIs. Mm -hmm. So it's staggering to see how the number has lessened or how it's shrunk over the years. It's great to though work with Wells Fargo at a time when we decided we were gonna invest $50 million in a group of MDIs. And the way we went about it was kind of non-traditional in a sense. Um, we literally uh, had a meeting because it took so long to get the money out the door. But the reason why is because we really needed to get to know the MDIs. We wanted our investment team to know the principles, to understand their strategic plan, to really understand what it means to be a mission-driven financial services institution in communities where we have a really tough time getting to the consumer. So to Nicole's point, MDIs are the trusted institution in the communities that tend to be, in, in some instances, low and moderate income, unbanked, underbanked, if, if anyone is going to garner that trust, it's that institution that's been there in some instances for over 100 years. So it was really wonderful to enter into that due diligence, that work. It took about eight months to get the money out the door, and we got it out the door in 2021, uh, all 50 million of it investing in 13 of the MDIs. Our approach was holistic, which means our employees are very engaged in some of what we're doing with the MDIs. We had the opportunity to help an MDI because we knew the strategic plan. We understood what Kenneth Kelly was trying to do with First Independence Bank. So we were able to donate a branch to a nonprofit in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and bring the first black-owned MDI into the marketplace as a result of that. Uh, working with five other banks in that community, just helping to, to make that expansion happen. Because at the end of the day, we need more MDIs. We need more MDIs. Uh, Wells Fargo, you all know, is a huge institution. We're multinational, and we need partners like those MDIs in local communities to do three things. Number one, to make sure that there is better access to capital to small businesses and to minorities uh, and other underserved groups. Number two, to ensure that the products and services are relevant because the relevant products and services are offered by the MDIs for their constituency in the communities that they're serving. And then number three, we actually want to see a pipeline of talent and leadership coming into the larger institutions from the MDIs if they choose to do that. But it's a great way to make the partnership 
mutually beneficial. But it's, it's, uh, that's one of the ways. And then, of course, I think we're going to talk about CDFI now or later. We're going to talk about CDFI? Because I'm excited about CDFIs, too. <laughs> you have the mic, Gigi. You Very excited mic. about CDFIs. And, you know, Darren said it well with PPP. It was, uh, you know, we made a conscious decision as Wells Fargo to just make sure all 420 million of those dollars were directed towards smaller, uh, not, uh, smaller businesses. And the way to do that, of course, as Darren very, very well articulated, is through CDFIs. That's a very important way to reach the smaller businesses, empowering the CDFIs to go into the marketplace where they're located uh, and to, to provide the small dollar loans and the, and the instruments that we find difficult to underwrite. And so um, $175 million to the CDFIs through a diverse community capital fund. Of course, that was back in 2015 to 2020. And then with PPP, $420 million, $250 million of that going to the CDFIs, and then the balance of that being for technical assistance and capacity building uh, for those CDFIs and for small businesses. And then, of course, we're looking at sustainability now, which dips into the innovation platform. And I think one of the most important ways that we work with uh, MDIs is through um, the National Bankers Association, Nicole. Thank so, you. <laughs> we've had a wonderful opportunity to invest uh, funding in the National Bankers Association. Under Nicole's leadership, we're in investing uh, in, in her nonprofit arm. We're also investing uh, our time and our talent in an advisory council that she's put together. We're the inaugural members of that council. And uh, so we, we know the importance of trades as much as the industry itself. They need the technical assistance, the capacity. They need people fighting and advocating on their behalf every day here in DC. And so I just want to applaud you, Nicole, on the great work that you're already doing uh, leading the National Bankers Association. So, Thank you, Gigi. <laughs> I love the diversity of opportunities to invest and partner that you just named, Gigi. There is the technical assistance, there is the grant making, there is the volunteering. There's also what your team gathered and learned from the experience as mm -hmm. well through that. Um, and while we do have two banks on this panel, I think you also highlighted a number of opportunities that are not just bank opportunities. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, and thinking about the role that we play in economic recovery through the recession, supporting communities, there are just a range of opportunities to um, support and invest. Well, um, with these I, would, I would add that one of the most exciting things, too, coming out of the MDI strategy and just getting to know the principles is, you know, we have huge corporate clients who mm -hmm. called us uh, and said, we want to invest in MDIs. Yeah. So not only were we able to let our clients know what we were doing and why it was important, but we were also able, some other banks used our documentation mm -hmm. in order to make investments in MDIs because we went through the due diligence the way that we did. We took a long time going through it, but we did get the money out the door, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we do have two financial institutions on this panel. We have two very different financial institutions in terms of the work they do, how they operate in the industry. Mike, we'd love to hear from Morgan Stanley's perspective how you deal with partnerships uh, sure. with MDIs and CDFIs. Sure, thank you. Um, one, I'm going to start. I'm going to hold up this book. If anybody wants a history mm -hmm. of the racial wealth gap, this is a great, a great it's, book. It's I, a wonderful book. The Color of Money, Black Banks, and the Racial Wealth Gap. A lot of history going back over 100 years talking about where, where, the, where we were, where we are today, things that have happened, but a great history. And I, I would encourage you to take a look as, you, as you're trying to learn this space. Listen, um, it's partnerships. It's all about knowing who you're, who you're doing business with. I, I, I'm at Morgan Stanley. Uh, we're an investment bank. We're a little bit different than, than the retail banks that are in, in a lot of communities around the country. We need to rely on partners uh, in communities to execute strategies for us. So, you know, what have we done? Uh, Lisa Mensa is uh, OFN. Uh, Beth's here today. You know, we'd, uh, we've got a long-standing history with the CDFIs, but we direct almost all of our activity uh, through through our OFN. Uh, we've granted them in the last 18 months just north of $20 million for downstreaming as capital. They select uh, CDFIs operating in communities of color, lower-income communities, smaller CDFIs. They determine winners. They determine outcomes. They're far better suited to do that as a partner than, than we would be. On the MDI space, we've had a longstanding relationship 
uh, in our backyard of New York with, with Carver. Michael Pugh is the CEO. Uh, we've expanded that now with Doyle Mitchell here, Industrial Bank, and Cynthia Day down in Atlanta at Citizens Bank. During the pandemic, we're talking about PPSP, the great work Darren's done. Listen, the first thing you had to deal with was the, was the financial impact of loan loss reserves, uh, the, un, the untold story. So working with MDIs, we quickly granted them money they could use as equity. We did not want an ownership stake. We granted about $20 million to the three organizations uh, really to help with the, the financial cost of the PPP program. Uh, and, and give them some money for, for overhead as well because it's not, not a lucrative program financially. So uh, selecting those partners. Listen, the only difference you're gonna find between uh, the, the caliber of, what, of Darren, Michael, Cynthia, Doyle, they could be running banks with a lot more commas and zeros, okay? These are some of the most highly talented people you're ever gonna meet. Meet Lisa Mensa. Uh, Morgan Stanley works with CDFIs. We've got over $3 billion of investments in private equity and loans that's managed by CDFIs. We, I, I outsource to people who know what they're doing in communities. We keep tabs, but we don't have a backroom execution shop for a lot of this. We, we partner with our CDFI partners. Uh, everything from a private equity fund to downstream capital into uh, pro, uh, developers, uh, low-income housing developers led by, by people of color in communities of color. Uh, three of those investments, Harlem, one Detroit, one in Charlotte all managed by, by CDFIs. How can you help? Get to know the people that run these organizations. Call them up, ask them what they need, ask them how you can make an impact. Size may not be as important as, as strategy, uh, but listen, you're gonna talk to some of the brightest minds in the financial services business doing old fashioned community banking. And just outreach, pick up the phone, you'll be blown away with how, how good People are at executing in a, in, a, in a very old fashioned way of knowing their clients and adding value to clients. The, their clients are not commodities, their clients are customers. So reach out. Thank you, Mike. I would echo that book is fantastic. If you don't have time to read the full book, there are a few fantastic podcasts of yes. the author that are also very good. Highly, highly recommend because I think it also tells the story of how we get from over 100 black owned banks yep. to where right. we are today. That's right. Absolutely. And why they are so critical and why we need more of them and more branches and more and more communities. Um, we'll close in just a, a moment here, but I think, Mike, to your point, the folks at the CDFIs and, and MDIs that we're talking about could be running banks with a lot more zeros. Mm -hmm. They're running a very highly complex business in these communities. They're providing a range of capital completing the full capital stack for many investments. And so thinking about the fact that there are so many ways in which you can participate, whether it be grant capital, equity capital, VCP, lending, et cetera. So to make sure we leave that point with everyone. Um, so as we close out, one more question for each of you. One piece of advice or guidance for a non-bank entity thinking about how to engage um, in this work in communities around deploying capital, what would that be? So maybe Nicole, I'll start with you. Yeah, I would say that there are four ways, and we've worked with BRT members on all four of these ways that folks can partner and, and work with MDIs. Uh, and because a lot of them aren't banks like, like Wells Fargo, they don't know where to start. And so they've been leveraging the National Bankers Association to identify ways, whether it's Moody's or MasterCard, or you know, I see a number of strategic partners, JP Morgan Chase in the room, who we've been working with. And the four key ways are, one, financial support. So whether it is capital, you're giving it to uh, directly to a, a to bank or an equity fund or your grants, which I think is really important. Morgan Stanley did that. It's, it's, it's really important that you're doing grants. The second is around tech, right? We've talked a lot about tech. Tech, tech involves everything, how we live, work, play, and even more so, how we bank. And so leveraging your technology levels uh, rails, leveraging your expertise is important. Talent, expertise, we oftentimes don't have our own in-house IT personnel or in-house people who can help with uh, compliance or helping us figure out how we're growing because we're growing two, three times. So how do you help us figure those things out? Capital, tech, talent, and business opportunities. Identifying who are you banking with? Mm -hmm. um, are you banking with an MDI? Are you leveraging CDFIs? And there could be ways, whether it's your diverse vendor programs, are we a preferred lender as your diverse vendors need to grow? Are you working with us on, on various opportunities. Your big banks are oftentimes working with us and they've made commitments to MDIs and CDFIs so they can bring us into the loop. So those are ways, capital financial support, tech, 
talent, and business opportunities. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Darren? So ditto to everything Nicole just said. <laughs> I, I, I would agree. Let me, let me take a little different spin. So as the book Mike shared will clearly explain, we didn't get here overnight. Uh, yeah. This has been a systematic, structural, intentional, uh, centuries-long effort to um, um, provide a lack, not to provide a lack, of, a lack, and provide capital to communities of color. And so this is a long game. This is not going to happen overnight. This is not, you know, uh, quarter to quarter. Uh, you may not see the type of impact that you're used to seeing uh, in other, um, other areas overnight. It's going to take long-term, intentional um, practices and support of MDIs and CDFIs to make this work. And so I just want to encourage the BRT to, to make this permanent. This ought to be an annual event. Uh, we ought to, you know, what's happening really in the MDI and CDFI space, it's being led by, by um, uh, mainstream financial institutions to support the investment, but it's also catalyzing others. Uh, and so we've been able to receive investments from smaller regional banks that are following uh, in the footsteps of these large, uh, large BRT members, but also we're receiving uh, support from non-traditional uh, you know, banks and others. And so just keep doing what you're doing, uh, double down on it, and understand that this is not gonna happen overnight. It takes you know, patient, uh, intentional action to reverse what we've seen for centuries. Ditto and ditto, and I would say uh, invest in the National Bankers Association. Uh, invest in the loan funds. Um, make sure that the capital is available for the trade to really provide support and advocacy for what the MDIs need across the board. Um, I would also say um, amplify what an MDI and a CDFI is. One of the things that's been interesting to me in and it's good to know OFN is in the room. I used to manage that national relationship for the bank a long time ago. And we built this um, awards program called the Opportunity Finance Next Awards. And the idea for the Next Awards was literally to amplify that there are these institutions called CDFIs that small businesses could get access to for accessing capital. And I don't know whether people today even know what a CDFI is broadly, the way that we intend. So that's another thing that we can do as private industry, amplify these instruments for change, amplify them. Uh, and we can leverage our assets to do that in, 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 large, in large part. And then finally, uh, when we took the investments in the MDIs, we were very deliberate about how we structured those uh, so that the MDIs would maintain ownership uh, and not take uh, you know a lot of um, you know, liberty with having board placements and all that kind of stuff, just really kind of be flexible. Darren said it's a long game, it's a long game, and we need to really think about how we level the playing field. And so we need to be flexible, we need to be reasonable, but we most importantly need to be informed. Uh, so getting to know these institutions is important. If you have an MDI uh, in your local markets, encourage your employees to take a look at those um, institutions in your employee volunteerism and then just educate. Thanks, Gigi. Mike? Well, I'm going to shift gears. I'm going to give Nicole a little work. <laughs> I don't one mind. Of, I've, of been, the, I've been tasked with a lot of work. One of the largest actually. programs for economic development in this country is the New Market Tax Credit yeah. Program run by the mm -hmm. CDFI Fund at Treasury. That's true. Uh, but I work for a large bank. Large banks apply for these awards. We, we receive awards and grants. What in the world do I know about the highest and best needs in the communities that need to be impacted by New Market Tax Credit dollars? Darren knows, Doyle Mitchell knows, Cynthia Day knows, mm -hmm. Michael Pugh. Mm -hmm. Per the information in this book, that program, $16 billion worth of grants, Congresswoman Waters said one black-owned bank got an award mm -hmm. out of $16 billion awarded. One of the barriers is just the cost to apply is mm -hmm. off the charts. They don't look at your bank exams, they don't look at your CRA exams, they force you to go through a, a laborious process mm -hmm. that most MDI, nobody's going to spend the money for. Yep. Uh, I would encourage everybody in this room to work with Nicole, get set-asides out of that program so that these banks and these communities can, one, earn money delivering that, that scarce money, attract corporate capital in the form of tax, tax credit investments, and provide a meaningful impact. This money I, I work on Wall Street. I work for Morgan Stanley. We should not be determining who receives these funds. Okay? Highest and best use. Darren knows a lot more about the Delta and, and Arkansas than I'll ever know. We need, we need to really work with, with your group and work with that fund. It's the community development 
financial institutions fund. Yep. It's not the bricks and mortar yep. financial institution fund. So we need to really work to get that money repositioned and open up opportunities for investments for corporate America to come in with you. Mike, and I they'll see how good you are. I think yeah. that deserves yep. a round of applause. Thank you. We work. <laughs> we got a partner to work on it with. <laughs> I can't thank the four of you enough for this conversation. I would just also close with, I think 2020 certainly heightened the attention on CDFIs and MDIs, whether it was COVID, PPP, the murder of George Floyd, attention was drawn, but it was attention that was necessary for a very long time and the sustained commitment's incredibly important. As we think about where we are currently economically, the need is even greater and the need will continue to be great. And so this is, less about long-term commitment and more about systemic integration yeah. of CDI, DFIs, and MDIs right. and how we think about investment in our communities and our economy more broadly. So again, thank you to the four of you for this conversation. These are all friends and neighbors, so it was good to, to bring this group together. And uh, thank you all for the discussion. Thank you, Candace.